Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, November 6, 2014 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. May we please have the roll call. Chairman Sullivan? Here. Council Jordan? Here. Council McCausland? Here. Council Ray? Here. Council Sherman? Here. Council Wagner? And Council Walsh? Here. And we'll now pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The very first item we have tonight is something very special. It is the presentation of the Ralph T. Gould Award. And so what I'd like to do is turn this over at this moment to Councillor David Sherman, who's going to proceed with this presentation. Uh, good evening. Uh, tonight it's my real distinct privilege and honor uh, to uh, present uh, the 2014 Ralph Gould Award. Uh, this award was established in 1986 and was named for the late Ralph Gould to recognize his community service and subsequently to recognize those in our town who provide community service in the same spirit as Mr. Gould. In short, the award honors somebody who has made a positive and lasting impact on Cape Elizabeth and its citizens. And this year, uh, the town council uh, unanimously selected uh, David Weatherby as a recipient of the Ralph Gould Award. Uh, before I continue and uh, heap all kinds of accolades on David, I see that he is here with an entourage, uh, his family, uh, and I was just wondering if David would be willing to quickly stand up and introduce who he has with him tonight. Sure. All right, thank you, David. Uh, the reason uh, that we chose David Weatherby as the recipient of the Ralph Gould Award is for his 16 years as serving as the president of the Beach to Beacon Race Committee and helping make this race a premier sporting event in the state of Maine and, frankly, in the world. Uh, uh, hundreds of runners from around the world, from elite runners to recreational runners, uh, make it a point to come to Cape Elizabeth every August to compete in this event. And rather than having me talk about the Beach to Beacon, uh, we asked the race founder, uh, Joni Benoit Samuelson, to come up here and say a few words about uh, David's tremendous commitment uh, to this event. So, Joni. We applaud Joni. Thank you very much, David. Um, thank you, councillors, and um, thank you, Town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, this is truly an honor and a pleasure and a real privilege for me to make the, or help make this award to, to David. Um, and I'm touched that he introduced me as part of his family. I almost feel as though I was uh, part of his family growing up. Um, Sue taught me how to swing a tennis racket. Um, Keith really helped to mold me into the person I am today after taking two classes with him, biology and physics at KPI. And um, I've known Tracy for many years. I think uh, they led our daughter to Bates rather than Bowden, but we won't go there. Um, <laughs> so I've known the Weatherbees for a long time, and you could not be honoring a better person this evening. Um, I guess when I think of David, he is totally unflappable. He's totally capable. He's as honest as they come. He can make tough and difficult decisions in an instant. Um, and he really has a real passion for not only the town in which he grew up, but also for the sport of running, 
which is enjoying huge growth in numbers. I think primarily because it's very accessible and affordable. And the town of Cape Elizabeth has opened their doors to a sport that has done so much good in this, in this town, in this state, and in this country. And David really has um, a vision that has helped to take our race to a level that we never thought it would achieve. And um, he has continued to dedicate his time, and I want to thank Tracy as well, because I know how much time he has taken away from his family to pursue excellence for the, the Beach to the 10K here in Cape Elizabeth. And it is on every runner's um, to-do list or bucket list um, because of the real insights and, and talents that, that David has as an executor. And um, I just want to thank David. Um, I'd like to think that I helped to take uh, care of David during his formative years when I used to babysit um, for, for David and his siblings, but um, he's really done it all on his own, and you should be very proud to be making this award to David, and I'm just honored that David Backer asked me to be part of this presentation. So I applaud David. Long may you run. Long may you continue to contribute to your community because I know you've contributed to the town in countless other ways. And uh, Thanks for being a visionary, a leader, and a really good friend. Uh, David's energy and enthusiasm spills over into many other aspects of life in our town. Uh, for three years, he served on the uh, board of directors for the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation including one year as treasurer and one year as president. During his year as president, we launched a capital campaign that raised over three quarters of a million dollars for our schools. Uh, David has also kite coached high school track and cross country uh, here in Cape Elizabeth. He's also served on the board of directors for Casco Bay Youth Hockey. Uh, David's uh, energy and enthusiasm for sports uh, and life in general is unmatched, and I am extremely proud to present the Ralph Gould Award to him this year. So David, please come on up. Well, <clears throat> First of all, I was um, astonished to um, receive the phone call from Jessica uh, about a month ago, um, and it's given me some time to sort of reflect about the award and the recipients um, that, that, have, um, that have had this honor. Um, and it, it's really humbling to accept this award, um, joining the distinguished uh, list of past recipients. And, um, you know, Joni touched on a number of things that I was going to say. Um, which isn't, doesn't surprise me because uh, that happens quite a bit in our race too. Um, but um, I, I just would like to say that um, it's been a, a huge privilege um, for me to be the president um, of the TD Beach to Beacon Road Race uh, for a period of 16 years. It really, um, you know, I was 28 years old when Joni asked me to take that spot. Um, and we did countless runs together um, and talked about her vision um, for bringing a world-class event um, to her hometown um, and how it was really about um, you know, getting, getting people to the sport and a healthy lifestyle. Um, and it's really um, grown well beyond uh, what we ever thought it was going to be. Um, and um, we're extremely fortunate for that. Um, but I would just like to, to point out that the Beach to Beacon Road Race wouldn't be a world-class event, and it wouldn't be really a jewel of summertime in Maine um, if it was not for the initial support and the continuing support uh, of the town council, um, of Mike McGovern, um, and the departments in the town that roll up to Mike. And just in particular, um, you know, from the get-go, Chief Williams and Sue Weatherby and Bob Malley and Chief McGoldrick I mean, from the early years, they were on board with their staffs 100% um, behind this event. 
um, and really played a huge role uh, in help ramping the event and shaping it into what it is today. Um, I often talk about the many legs of the stool that are associated with the race, and certainly you have to have the sponsorship. Um, you know, and you, you can't under, understate the importance of Joni and what she means to the sport, um, what she means to society in general, what she means to the state. Um, you know, our organizing committee, which is made up of a lot of residents in Cape Elizabeth, is 60 people strong. Um, and the role that Dave McGilvery and his team plays, um, there's 800 volunteers, half of them come from Cape Elizabeth. Um, and really, you know, that first year that we had the race, I wondered how it was going to be accepted in this town. And it wasn't accepted, it was embraced. And it's been embraced every year since. And I don't know what the numbers are, but I can assure you that the majority of residents in this town are a part of this race, whether they're a runner, whether they're a volunteer, whether they're a spectator. Um, and many residents have been all three. Um, so, you know, it, I, I was fortunate to be um, asked to do this um, from Joni. Uh, it was a huge privilege. I took it very seriously. Uh, I put thousands of hours into it, but it's really the collective effort um, of all those groups um, that have made this race such a significant part of the fabric of this community. It, it really is, and, it, and as Joni mentioned, it is a must-do race, not only for the world-class runners, um, but for people locally um, and for people around the state. So um, finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my family. Uh, you know, my role models are here. My mother and my father are here tonight. Um, you know, their service record to the town speaks volumes, and I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree as far as that's concerned. Um, only one of my three children was able to make it tonight because two of them are away, but my son Peyton's here. He's a sophomore uh, at Cape High School. Um, and then finally, um, you know, my wife Tracy uh, is just, um, she's been a rock for me. Um, it's a lot of work that goes into this event. She's been supportive of it, of me being involved from the get-go um, and has helped me in numerous ways um, and I appreciate all that uh, she's done for me. So finally, I'd just like to say thank you again. Um, this is truly an honor and uh, I'm humbled to be here and accept this award. Thank you. I'd like to point out that all, while uh, David has his own plaque in his hand, his name is already up on the wall on the plaque where we have listed all of uh, Cape Elizabeth Ralph Gould Award winners. So your name is up there already, and congratulations again. Jessica, did you want to see picture? Picture? Okay. Do you want a picture? You should. Uh, David, maybe. could we prevail upon you and maybe your, your entourage to join Jessica and me for a quick photo opportunity? If only we had something that took a picture. Yeah, we do. We have these. I got it right here. Our next uh, section is uh, Town Council Reports and Correspondence. But we have something else very special to do. It's a night of awards. 
And uh, the next thing we're going to do is express our appreciation for outgoing counselor David S. Sherman, Jr. So what I'd like to do is I have a few words prepared. We have a gift from the council, but I would like, if you would, Dave, to just introduce your family that's here. Uh, sure, and I need to express my thanks to my family for putting up with uh, all of these evening meetings, etc. My wife, uh, Moe, is there. Uh, I don't know if you're willing to stand up. <laughs> uh, my mother, Beverly Sherman, uh, who is probably known to many of you due to her recent involvement in the library. Uh, my youngest son, Cooper Sherman, who uh, is uh, always very interested in town council business when we discuss it at the dinner table. And then my father, David Sherman, uh, is here. My two older sons are away at college, so they weren't able to be here tonight. So thank you for coming. So what I'm going to do is say a few words. Um, I would then invite, I will invite other counselors to say a few words as well uh, about their thoughts of serving with David <coughs> these years. So I'm here. Just hang on to that one. Okay. Tonight is Councilor David Sherman's last town council meeting with us. It is our privilege and honor to celebrate Dave's service to Cape Elizabeth through his past six years on the town council and before that, six years on the planning board. Of course, he has done many other things for Cape Elizabeth citizens, but I'm concentrating on his volunteer hours and service with our town government tonight. Dave was also town council chairman in 2011 and uh, during these past six years has served on numerous committees. Serving with Dave in any capacity has always been inspirational and a distinct pleasure. We will sorely miss his presence and quiet leadership, and we deeply appreciate the countless hours he has given to the town of Cape Elizabeth so that our citizens may enjoy an increasingly effective, efficient, and compassionate town government. I think that the following words of favorite, I'm a student of history, Douglas MacArthur, uh, beautifully described leadership qualities that we have learned to appreciate in Dave and I believe we will sorely miss. And these words are, a true leader has the confidence to stand alone, the courage to make tough decisions, and the compassion to listen to the needs of others. He does not set out to be a leader, but becomes one by the equality of his actions and the integrity of his intent. So, I would like to invite other councils to speak. Council Wagner. Yeah, I want to start by saying I'm going to personally miss you on the council. I've enjoyed serving you. Um, I appreciate how deliberate David is uh, as a counselor. Um, we, we share a profession, and maybe that's part of our profession. But you know, it's it's incumbent upon us as as counselors to consider all different sides of an issue, and I, I think David has been stellar in that regard. Um, he's also an incredibly patient counselor. Uh, I know in some of our internal deliberations when he's been tasked with uh, crafting something, uh, he takes all of our edits uh, very seriously and goes, goes back and reflects on them and, and puts out a wonderful work product. And, um, and, f and finally, he's been incredibly responsive to his constituents. Uh, even today, on his last council uh, night, he, uh, he, res he responded very in depth to two uh, emails of concerned citizens uh, about a, an ordinance uh, that's before the council. And uh, I appreciate that maybe above all other things that have, because uh, that is our, our highest duty. Thank you. Councilor Jordan? Well, I'll definitely miss having you sit next to me. You've been next to me ever since I got on the council, so. It has been a pleasure to have you guide me through my first years. Thank you. Councillor McCausland. I'd like to add my two cents and just say I agree. I'm going to miss you tremendously next year. I'm very excited that we have Patty Grennan joining us, but I'm going to miss you as well. You have been a tremendous role model for me this year. Your comments were always thoughtful and insightful, and your responses <coughs> whether it was to a discussion we were having here on the council or in any kind of engagement with the public, always 
measured and the results pragmatic. I, I couldn't have asked for more. You were terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ray. Um, same with me. I mean, I don't want to repeat everything, but I just want to say you've done a wonderful job um, seeing the forest through the trees. Oftentimes we get stuck in the details and you would come through with, uh, okay, here's where we need to go. Um, and you always had a thoughtful approach to all issues. And even when they, they were um, difficult for either the council or the, um, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, you were always thoughtful in how you thought about and presented a possible solution, but direct. And I think that's wonderful. Thank you. Council Walsh. Well, Jessica, I'm, I've had the privilege of working with David for five years, um, and uh, I, it's, been, uh, it's been absolutely fabulous. I mean, I, you've been a voice of reason. Um, you've been uh, a mentor to us, to many of us. You've even taken me to the woodshed when I needed to be taken to the woodshed when you were chair. Um, but what I see is a, as, as a person who has uh, convictions, you have ethics, and you have passion about the work that you've done here as a town councilor. And um, you listen to all sides, and it, it never ceases to amaze me, no matter what the issue is, no matter how difficult it is. You, you listen to citizens' input, and you tell citizens and you tell your fellow councilors where you're coming from. That's one uh, part of, of what makes David Sherman special, is that you know where he's coming from. Uh, and I, I have to tell you, I'm going to miss you, um, but I also feel very strongly that uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth, its citizens, and your fellow councillors are better for your work. And um, we wish you the best. And uh, we expect to see you up, standing up there telling us where we may or may not have been right or need to think about or whatever. But again, I, I welcome that because I think those, those, uh, those, uh, that mentoring is, uh, is something you do so naturally. And, um, and I, I welcomed it. And uh, I think we're, again, we're better for your efforts. And it's going to be tough. But uh, Patty is coming on board, filling those shoes. Um, and I know Caitlin's going to miss having you sitting next to her. But uh, at the end of the day, um, you've served us well. And, uh, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, um, thank you for your service. So, on behalf of your fellow councillors. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. I know there are people here ready to talk about their issues, so I try to do this quickly. <laughs> This is a uh, framed photograph of Town Hall that I believe was taken by Jack Keneally. Yes. And uh, I've always liked this photograph. I think there's one hanging up in David Backer's office. In <laughs> and uh, I've always admired it, so thank you very much. Thank you. Much thank you. We have two other sort of special <clears throat> items under reports, and then we'll get into our usual council reports and correspondence. The next item, <clears throat> we have an update on the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee. If I could ask their chairman, Mr. Seekins, to approach the podium. We're laughing back there a little bit, uh, and just mind you that uh, after those two nice awards, that maybe I should come back in December or something. <laughs> But uh, as we state in our committee meetings, uh, we take our charge very seriously with the Senior Citizen Advisory Commission, and we realize that we're speaking many times for people that don't have a voice in this community, and, and that's really the backbone of our work and what gets us out to our meetings. And again, good evening. Thank you. My name is Brett Seekins. I am the chairman of the Senior Citizen Advisory Committee. I do have a few fellow members here tonight, but I, I do not work alone, and I also like to include in my comments tonight the work of Elizabeth Bailey, Patricia Bradenburg, William Marshall, Bruce Nelson, June O'Neill, and Barbara Page. We were, uh, well, the town council decided in January that 
we're going to study the care needs of those in our community that are aged 60 and over. There was a selection <coughs> process and we were seated in April. Since then, by design, our process has been to meet twice a month for two hours here from 11 to 1 every Tuesday. Uh, we've been very active, we've been very busy. In fact, the last four or five weeks we've met every week working on um, several different items which, which uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about. So we have some preliminary <coughs> observations for you. We have a progress report, if you will, let you know a little bit about what we're doing. And then as we move into this budget season, we do have some suggestions for you. So there's some considerations, some things that anecdotally we put together through our research or that we've heard from some of the folks that came in and, and gave presentations to our group. We've been very active in that area. We've had a lot of uh, associations come and speak with us. There's uh, a lot of different governments that know what we're up to. And certainly, you folks here have our support. There's other members in the community. And there's a lot of folks, sorry. And there's a lot of folks up in Augusta that are kind of watching this activity, what we're, going, uh, what, what we're doing, particularly in Cape Elizabeth, um, for a number of reasons. But um, we do know that aging is a serious issue in this country. And it's a very serious issue in Maine, as Maine has the oldest average age uh, uh, state. It's the oldest average age state in the country. So thank you again. What we offer you tonight is a progress report. You each should have a copy of this presentation. I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit. I don't want to miss any of these talking points that we've come up with. Um, again, we've been seated since April. We meet twice a month for two hours. <coughs> Over that time, our design was, that would be, be really nice if seven of us sit in a room for a couple hours, twice a month. But what if we were able to reach outside of that room and touch people out in the community? That does two things. It lets them know we're taking a look at this and we're serious about it because we're dedicating all this time. But also, it gets them thinking about, well, maybe there is a problem over, over here. And maybe there is a service gap. And rather than us coming back to you with, hey, we need money for this or we need money for that, somebody out in the community realizes there's a service gap. And that can be filled by somebody outside. And we don't have to go back to the town for scarce resources. That was our design. We have um, had 12 different speakers. We've held three public input sessions. We were participants in the very recent and very successful first ever uh, Cape Elizabeth Senior Health Exposition. Uh, we did uh, some senior, we, we prepared a survey and we've, uh, we've uh, did uh, receive uh, many completed forms back at the Senior Health Expo and we've touched other people out in the community. So we've kind of studied this within the group, but externally as well. And we have some results that formed our opinions and recommendations in this report. We did examine the demographic profile of Cape Elizabeth. Maybe it will surprise you to know that about 24% of our residents are 16 over and 9% are 75 over. So we are officially there. Uh, we've also established contacts with our local churches. Our churches do a phenomenal amount of work with their congregation supporting folks that are in need. We wanted to make certain that we didn't leave them out of this process. We've also informed Maine DHHS. Commissioner Mayhew is aware of our work, as is uh, Director Ricker, ha Ricker Hamilton, who's in second command to Commissioner Mayhew. And we've also worked with the Office of Aging and Disability Services. So, Based on that work, we had some initial findings, and we just wanted to report those out to you. We've developed them into you know, four core competencies that, that we're kind of hearing or we're thinking or we've learned from other folks that have come in and presented to us. And as I talk about other presenters, we have really have had a great group come and talk to us. We've had the AARP. We've had the Iris Foundation. Eyesight's a very big problem in the senior population. One out of three people are going to suffer from some form of eye disease and need some assistance. That's very, very important in community planning. We had the Volunteers of America come in, and come in and see us. We had a meeting with the Office of Aging and Disability Services. We had the Cape Elizabeth South Portland Triad Group speak to us. Uh, Senator Rebecca Millett stopped in, and so did Representative Kim monahan Derrick. Uh, there's a number of, number of other folks. Community services did meet with us a couple different times. So we're making sure they kind of know what we're doing and we're trying to figure out what they're doing and see maybe if we can marry up a few things and achieve some economies of scale. Back to our core competencies. But we're able, we've kind of <coughs> defined our, what we've learned into four categories. Transportation, communication, social opportunities, and affordable housing and taxation. 
with regard to transportation, those that we spoke with, these needs were, were consistently raised, that some folks need some assistance with functional and daily living activities. Other folks need some assistance in transportation to attend specific events or appointments. Others desire, need, desire a need for social and community events, transportation to and from. And then others need some assistance to get to you know, health care appointments. And the major concern we have here is if there is a lack of transportation, and we probably need to do a little more, more work. We've only been seated for seven months, and we're asked to, to report out a little early. Our report's actually due in a year. But the major concern is, do, do we have any isolation in our community? And, that's, and, and we need to ask that question, because the next community that takes up this charge and takes a look, we want them to look at our report and know that we looked at that. Because if, if anyone in our community is isolated, that just leads to a multitude of other problems. And mainly, health care starts to, you know, their health care starts, starts to change. And what we end up is, you know, we've got this, someone that's in isolation here now has to go over to this very, very expensive institutionalized type system to get treated. Um, it's preventable. We also learned that we need to communicate more and differently. And there was a call from those folks that we spoke to to have a central location for information, referrals, and town services, whether that be something offered from the town or somebody within the town. There is a sense of confusion or you know, where do I turn to to get this? or Where do I turn to to get that? What we heard might be helpful is a, the development of a senior guide, similar to what community services issues a couple times a year for different events and programs that they might offer. Also, perhaps something like a senior hotline. Um, and again, we need to communicate differently in a few different ways. Folks that uh, might get a senior guide, they might not get it, they might not know what it is. If we can duplicate information in a few different areas, maybe someone can't read that senior guide, they have some vision problems. Well, there's a senior hotline that kind of, it's a call-in type thing, it kind of mimics what's in the senior guide a little bit. You kind of get the idea what I'm doing. Uh, we need to communicate more and differently. There's also this, uh, you know, perhaps what we're hearing is we'd like to see a senior center and a staffed senior center and, and a physical location where seniors can go. The major concern, the lack of communication or understanding or misunderstanding of where information is kept leads to confusion and barriers to timely assistance. I've combined the last two core companies, uh, core competencies into social opportunities and then a few miscellaneous other items. So what we're hearing is that social opportunities may be limited and there's a need for more varied programs and activities in the town. This potential of a senior center with activities is discussed among our residents and neighbors. We're seeing we're hearing kind of this absence of a town center with older folks where town center is a lot more maybe meaningful to them rather than, you know, our children, let's say, uh, because that's how they grew up. There was a town center connectivity. And folks are reaching out through neighbors, but as they age, maybe they're not going to go to that neighborhood party. Maybe they're not going to go down to the beach and do the raking and all that stuff. Uh, so that's a concern to them. There is uh, a lot of activities in our churches. There is interfaith outreach and connection. However, we keep hearing the town, the town. Um, affordable housing, we heard that a lot. Property taxes become a burden. And we do have some health care concerns with regard to access and cost. The major concerns are the connectivity to the town could be lost for some folks. Also. Cost of, living, cost of living, utilities, taxes on a fixed income can force our residents to move from our community. That said, we do submit to you some recommendations for your consideration. And the first one, um, we were asked to report out early. We hope this isn't the end of our commission. We are scheduled to uh, continue our work till the end of March 2015. And I can show you my commission members want to serve that full team. 
Our first full recommendation would be to allow us to do that. The second would be we believe that this commission should be a standing permanent commission. These problems, these issues, they're going to change year, year to year to year. And we really need to stay focused, stay on top of it, continue meeting. Uh, we would ask that you consider hiring or seeking a volunteer to lead some senior programming uh, or deal with senior issues in the town. That person will be a focal point for all those questions, issues, and concerns from our residents. We'd like to recommend that you distribute a sponsor or support uh, a sponsored quarterly household senior guide detailing essential services, activities, and important phone numbers to our residents. We would ask that we enhance the town website with a senior page. You know, it's easily identifiable. We heard that a lot. The town, the town website is a little complex for our seniors. Um, I have trouble finding <laughs> events at the high school. Uh, so uh, it certainly is not uh, just a senior problem. Uh, we would ask that we establish a pre-recorded senior hotline that mimics what might be in this um, on the town website and also establish a designated senior space within the town proper and existing infrastructure to support senior programming and senior issues and with regard to transportation and some of the social issues we would like to see a, a restoration of the transportation services that were offered some time ago and consider purchasing a van to whether do a demonstration program and slowly bring on some services, see how that works, or you know, we try you know, something, along, something along that line just, just to help with um, functional daily living and specific event type purposes trips to Mill Creek, trips to the mall, maybe some trips to some appointments. Just a demonstration program to see how that goes. That is about the end of my formal comments, uh, with the exception of uh, we did have the privilege of having Matt Sturgis uh, uh, on our commission as the town liaison, and we'd like to thank him publicly for his work. He's been invaluable to us. Thank you, Matt. What do you think? Well, thank you. We have a lot, of more work, a lot more work to do. We were asked to report out a little bit to give you all something to think about. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brett. Would you please introduce uh, the other committee members who are here with you tonight? Certainly. Barbara Page. Can you please stand, Barbara? Bill Marshall. And June O'Neill. Great. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Well, this is a very comprehensive update, and I would like to just take very briefly a moment if any councils have any questions. Council McCausland? I have a couple of questions. Um, first, I'd like to say great work, and thank you for the presentation. This was terrific, and you've come up with some really interesting suggestions. Um, where do you see the committee going between now and March? What else are you planning to look into? And do you have a plan to come back with additional recommendations? Or um, are you planning to refine these recommendations? What's next? I think we could refine these recommendations. But also, we have reached out to a few other folks that were hopeful that could come in and present to us. An elder abuse attorney, we think it's very important to get that person's notes and comments into the, uh, this report. Elder abuse is at an all-time high, and, and we just need to have some general awareness in our community, more awareness that, that help is there. And we think by having someone come in, make that presentation, uh, <coughs> spoken with uh, Mr. Raftis, I think you all might know him. He's going to come in and chat with us. But we'd like to if we can continue this work. Also, I've spoken with Larry Gross at the Southern Maine Areas on Agency. He's the president of that organization. They do a lot of work out in our communities, and certainly in Cape Elizabeth. We want to hear a report from him on where he's a very, very important group. They do so many wonderful things. We just want to hear what they're doing and what they think they can do here for us and report out on that. Um, the rest of it. So we're, we're thinking those few meetings could take place between now and the end of December. Mm -hmm. And then the next few months we would work on issuing a formal report to you all. That's great. Thank you. 
Thank you. Council Wagner? Yeah, thanks for your presentation. It was excellent. Um, if there were two things I could ask for you to do before you come back to us again, I, I wonder if you could um, look into what the cost would be associated with the uh, requested passenger van. And the other thing would be um, on the senior programming idea, what, what does the Cape Elizabeth Community Services currently do and how, how do you see the Cape Elizabeth Community Service involvement with that, with that sort of request? I'll have those responses for you. How would you like me to communicate those to you? I mean, when you re respond again to the, uh, the council, or okay. we're always available by email, too, if there's anything you want to say. And, and we have discussed those two questions that you have raised. I won't answer them now. I'll talk to my fellow uh, commission members at the next meeting to get a formal response. It, uh, the answers involve some other <laughs> folks, obviously. So I want to make sure I get their comments as well. Thank you. Okay, and Council Walsh? Uh, first of all, I want to thank Brett for this very thoughtful presentation and on a topic that I think is uh, very timely and very important to the Council. The fact that all this good work has been going on for as long as it has, the feeling was that we should give you a 15 or 20 minute presentation on this subject, especially as we, we look to establishing our goals and objectives for next year. So this really was more of a preemptive approach to what we believe is a very important issue facing our community and one that we want to be ahead of. And um, I'm, I'm just really thrilled with what has been done and I'm glad that it's been received by the committee in the way it has. So, Brett, again, your uh, group is, uh, when you think about the number of hours that this group has been working, twice a month for two plus hours, not to mention the pre-work and the work that's done after the meeting, chasing down all of these issues, it's really, again, a wonderful citizen committee that is just put their heart, soul into it, and I really, my hat's off well, to we, Brett and the team. Thank so. you, Councilor Walsh, and again, we say often, our seniors deserve no less than that effort. Right. Yeah, and we really appreciate that. Thank you, Jessica, for allowing us to take the time as well in, in the agenda today. Thank you all. Brett, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Uh, next, next item is an update on council goals for 2014, and, and I thought I'd uh, present that. Um, I don't know, I'm, everyone has probably seen that uh, in your council packet, but we're, we're actually, in a, we've done extremely well. And I think just anecdotally, it looks like we're about 90% complete on our council goals for 2014. So unless anyone has any questions or comments, I think, yeah, okay. All right, and now let's proceed with, you know, our, our sort of our more usual town council reports and correspondence. Council Jordan. Yes, it's time for the appointments committee to appoint people to some commissions and boards here in town. And so we're currently seeking applications for the Conservation Commission, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, the Personnel Appeals Board, the Recycling Committee, and the Zoning Board of Appeals. You can find the applications on the town website, and tomorrow is the deadline to apply, so we please encourage you to try and check that out tonight or tomorrow so that we can get you scheduled for an interview. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Walsh. Well, um, I think that we had a big event here on Tuesday, and I think uh, our hat's off to Deb Lane and her team for uh, marshalling us through the election day. I, I met her briefly this morning, and I asked her if she'd been re she was recovering, and she said she was on the way to recovery. Not quite there yet. But again, a, a yeoman's job done with, with all of the, the pre-election time that this, this room was set up for people to vote ahead of time. I mean, it just, the amount of work and the amount of time and energy and effort that's expended to make that happen and allowing us to use uh, our democratic right to vote is just very impressive. So thank you, Deb. For that and the second item is um, I had the privilege along with a couple of other counselors to attend uh, an event at the Inn by the Sea on on Saturday night our 250th anniversary committee hosted a cocktail party to um, start the ball rolling for this year of our anniversary and uh, incredible event and uh, represented by all ages and all generations and just 
fantastic. I mean, just it's hard to believe. I mean, the place is 250 years old, and just the presentations and the presentation boards and the, you know, the, the constant loop of information being presented in that room was was awesome. It really was, and the enthusiasm about uh, the uh, symphony uh, coming to Portland head light is pretty amazing. So, good stuff and uh, a great weekend for Cape Elizabeth in a lot of ways. Dr. Sherman? Yeah, I, I likewise had the uh, privilege of attending that event. Um, I'm maybe going to go off the regular routine here, but I didn't have a chance to thank you all uh, for your kind words, and I just uh, because it's my last chance to speak from this side of the, the table. Uh, I did want to uh, express my uh, appreciation to the, the town citizens for giving me the opportunity to serve on the council for the past six years. Uh, I see a few of my former colleagues from the council out in the audience, or at least one, and I think I, I, I speak for the council as a whole when I say this is a very rewarding uh, experience, but it is not always without uh, controversy. Uh, tonight, pretty soon, we'll be delving into an issue that uh, citizens feel very strongly about, and, and that's sort of the fun, if you will, or the challenge of serving on the council, is trying to figure out a solution to issues or problems that are facing our community. But nothing would happen up here, nothing really would happen in our town government if we didn't have the engagement, the involvement of our town citizens. Uh, the, the 250th anniversary celebration, again, that's going to be spearheaded by a group of volunteer citizens. Many of the initiatives that we voted on, that we've implemented, come from our citizens. So uh, I, I give my uh, uh, hats off to our, our citizenry for continuing to be so engaged in what we do. Um, so I want to thank the citizens for electing me in the first place. I want to thank my fellow councillors, uh, both past and current. Uh, for bringing the energy and enthusiasm to what we do, all with a goal of trying to do what's right for our town. Uh, the past six years, we've managed to uh, forward the school board's proposed budget uh, to the town's voters, and every year it's been approved, and I'm not going to take credit for that. Uh, I think the school board and the superintendent, and past superintendents, have just done a tremendous job uh, justifying their budget and uh, selling it to both the council and then to the citizens. And the result is six years of uh, budgets being approved and no need for a second vote, which is very nice. Um, I, I thank my fellow council members. I, last but not least, I do need to thank the tremendous uh, management team that we have here in Town Hall and beyond. Uh, uh, Mike McGovern, in my view, is uh, the state of Maine's best town manager, bar none. It's been a real uh, privilege uh, working with you, Mike, for the past six years. Uh, uh, but everybody else, all the other department heads are just stellar, and the town of Cape Elizabeth is just very lucky to have uh, them and their staffs uh, working on behalf of its citizens. I do need to give a special uh, uh, word of appreciation to the town planner uh, who is here tonight. Uh, Boreen and I have actually worked together for 12 years, uh, six years on the planning board and six years on the council, and uh, I am just uh, continue to be so impressed with the work that she does uh, and the level of commitment she brings to her job. So uh, thank you, Maureen. And again, thank you, fellow councillors, and thank you, citizens, for this opportunity. I will miss it. But don't be offended. I don't think I'll come to many of your meetings in the future. <laughs> but I'll watch at home with interest. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Any other council reports or correspondence? I have a couple things. Um, <clears throat> the library bond passed, and it was a resounding, resounding vote in favor, and I can barely contain myself uh, because it's so exciting to, to realize that we will have a new and better facility for Cape Elizabeth citizens for the next three decades. It's going to be efficient, flexible, and will serve us as the years come with the changes in technology. And so I'd, I'd just like to thank the citizens for that vote. And I would like to have a, make a special thanks to two counselors that are here tonight. Uh, first of all, Jim Walsh, who, uh, whose leadership as an incoming chairman in 2013 made the library the top priority for the council then. And that, of course, continued through to this year. So I'd like to thank Jim.
for that vision and that commitment. And also Councilor Molly McCausland, who before she was a councilor was chairman of the Library Planning Committee, then later as a councilor, chairman of the Library Building Committee. And um, we're talking hundreds if not thousands of hours that have gone into this as well as on the part of uh, all the other volunteers, uh, citizen volunteers, members of the school department, as well as members of the council and staff and all that to, to bring to the town a tremendous plan at a modest price. And it was a very successful vote and we are all going to be so excited in the next couple of years to see this library develop. So I want to thank everyone for that. Council of Cosla. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> we should have coordinated our, our talking points before we start yeah. the meeting. Um, I, I too would like to say thank you for the opportunity to the council and to the citizens. This has been a tremendous opportunity for me to work on this project. I also think that the outcome is the result of a really thoughtful and deliberate process with lots of opportunity for public input and really I think the key word was collaboration. We took the time to hear from as many people as we possibly could so I want to thank sort of generically the citizens of town for, for being so willing to step up and participate. I wanted to thank the voters also for supporting both the project but also for recognizing the value of this incredible resource that we have in town and being willing to pay for it. Um, I also wanted to thank both current and former members of town councils and specifically um, our current and former um, council chairs, Jessica Sullivan and Jim Walsh, without whom we certainly would not be here tonight. I think both of them had identified the need for the renovation project and had the vision to move it forward. It was, um, it was just great to be able to, to work with both of you and to know that we had your support. Um, I'd also like to thank, obviously, the members of the planning committee and the building committee, including to my left, Councillor Kathy Gray, who came to, again, dozens, hundreds, I don't know how many meetings we've had over the last two years, um, former Council Member Frank Governale. We also had Martha Palmer from the Board of Trustees and Kate Hewitt from the School Board. We also um, had tremendous support and input from Principals Jeff Shedd and Kelly Hassan and from Facilities Director Greg Marles. Thanks to all of them. I also wanted to thank the trustees and the foundation and the, the um, Friends of the Library, all of whom were uh, very supportive of the project and the process and were out waving signs and handing out um, literature and giving tours of the library. Lots of enthusiasm and lots of help there. We also have a capital campaign committee that is a subcommittee of the foundation and um, perhaps some of you have already seen their sign. I saw it was up on Route 77 today. Um, they have done tremendous work and they have a little bit more work to do and some of you have already heard from them and some of you will be working with them in the future. I'd also like to make a special call out for them. I think um, uh, Blaine Grimes, Beverly Sherman, Joel Bassett, again Frank Governale and George Morse have really gone out of their way to make sure that that portion of the library that was not funded by the bond, that would be the furniture, fixtures, and equipment, will be supported through this fundraising effort. And we have had, again, tremendous, tremendous response from them. Um, I would like to also thank Mike McGovern, who held my hand through this process more than once. Very helpful. And um, one more special thank you and a call out for Library Director Jay Sherma and his staff, who gave us great input and guidance throughout the process. Lots of enthusiasm on Jay's part, in addition to his full-time job already operating the library. And he gave us some really great ideas about moving a library into the future. <coughs> Got us really focused on what the opportunities are in our community and what the opportunities are for libraries in general in the future. Um, and I'm sure in his mind, it's a wonderful thing that this bond was um, passed and voted so favorably in the town and now he really will have his hands full for the next year getting moved into that very small space in the Spurwing School Building. 
Um, but the end result will be wonderful because um, by early 2016, we will be fully operational in a new and renovated library. So thank you to all involved. Thanks for all the support. Thank you. I also would like to thank uh, the 250th Anniversary Committee and their chairman, Barbara Powers. I also had the opportunity to attend the kickoff celebration uh, last Saturday night. It was absolutely delightful. And um, it's going, it, it started what is going to be a wonderful year for our town, celebrating 250 years. And the other fun thing about that kickoff was, it was Saturday night, the 1st of November, 2015. And the actual date of incorporation at 250 years will be November 1st, 2015. So it was very timely and very well done. Um, I would like to congratulate Councilor Kathy Ray on her re-election to the council, and also uh, count, Council elect Patty Grennan, who will be joining us next month um, here um, in Town Hall. Um, I want to also thank our town clerk, Deborah Lane, for her wonderful work at the election. And I'm going to, I have asked her if she'd say a few words. It was, it was an unusual midterm election. <laughs> thank you very much. It appears I'm going to be talking in the same vein this evening about thanking and acknowledging um, groups of people, mainly our election staff, um, who again contribute in a different way uh, to our community. Um, Tuesday was an incredibly long day, as Jim alluded to. For some of us, it was actually 18 hours. Um, I can finally stand up a little straighter tonight. Um, so, in my view, um, our polling place was calm and orderly considering that for the vast majority of the day, the gym was full and there were lines down the hallway and outside. So I have to thank wholeheartedly our election staff for their patience, for their professionalism, uh, for keeping composure, when again, they most of the day had folks standing in line waiting to check in with them. So I'm really very, very proud of them. To give you just a little bit of statistics, the voter turnout was over 71%, 5,582 people. Of that, 29% had voted absentee ballots during the weeks uh, prior to the election, or 1,668. So we saw for voters on election day, over 3,900 people. Also during election day, um, for uh, new voters, changes to the voter list, name changes, et cetera, we processed over 300 transactions, which again, for one day in that, that time frame, really is incredible. Um, the preparation for the election really started in earnest in August, and we'll go really with all the reporting and stuff we have to do through December, January. So the big push is over, but there's still work to be done. Um, I'd like to thank the election clerks who as Council Walsh mentioned, um, worked in, in this room during the month of October. They adjusted their schedules. Um, they put off their meetings and their, their private uh, time to help us out, and I really do appreciate it. We really cannot do it um, without them. The town and school departments, thank you all for your help. I don't know if folks realize all the town and school departments involved in putting this election together. Um, the support of the departments, the support of the department heads. Looking at Greg Marles, he um, kind of talked me off a cliff, I guess, probably about 7 o'clock election night, that uh, when we still had lines out the door, it'll be all right. You'll, you'll be fine. You'll have enough ballots. And we did. <coughs> so thank you to, to everyone um, with that. Um, I just want to run down people's names. Please indulge me for a minute. I think it's worth it um, to acknowledge those folks who um, uh, really helped us with election staff is not to leave out any town departments or school departments and individuals, uh, but I do want to mention the election staff for everyone. Um, Tori Gilman, Sharon Gower, April Cohen, Jackie Coy, Lillian Bates, Scott Berry, Margaret Davenport, Marguerite Hollowell, Deborah Harney, Karen Holmes, Carol Ann Jordan, Karen Kerrigan, Terry Olson, Tina Sweeney, Linda Winker, and Megan Wink Winker. And we actually had uh, a visit from our former warden, Mr. Henry Adams, who is over 90 years old now, 
who as always came to check on to make sure that I'm upholding the laws um, <laughs> and ordinance of the state of Maine and the town of Cape Elizabeth. And I, I guess I got his approval again um, and look forward to seeing him the next time around as well. So thank you all for your indulgence on that and thank you again to our team. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Job well done. <coughs> thank you. <coughs> okay, uh, Finance Committee report. You have 24 pages uh, attached to your uh, packet today for your reading enjoyment. And our uh, excise taxes continue to be above budget, which is uh, good for the economy. Thank you, Council Walsh. And now we have an opportunity for citizens to discuss items not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone willing or wishing to discuss? Will, willing. Willing. <laughs> willing. <laughs> willing. Willing. <laughs> wishing to discuss any items that are not on tonight's agenda. Okay, the town manager's report, please. Yes, th thank you, Jessica. I'll, I'll be I'll be very brief. Uh, I was. I think this is an historic council meeting. We've never spent an hour before. <laughs> Before the first agenda item, <laughs> celebrating community and celebrating citizen involvement and everything else, and you know, I, I, th I think that's terrific. And uh, you know, although it is, we, we do need to get to roosters at some point. Uh, you know, I join in, in praising all that's occurred. You know, particularly uh, Dave Sherman. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to repeat everything that's been said about David, but you know, just summing up one thing, I just think it was terrific that his parents were here this evening. You know, the same with Dave Weatherby, that his parents were here. To, to hear two people that, you know, just to have parents see that, you know, that in that, both, in that case, two sons really did well for their community. And, you know, really, a, a, you know, in addition to do everything, they're, they're both good people. And, uh, you know, I, I know I speak for all the department heads. Uh, you know, every single person has greatly enjoyed serving with you, serving for you and uh, just respecting all that you've done to try to make this community a, a great place to live. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, just uh, two other <coughs> quick things. I, I will limit it to with the time. Uh, I, I do want to mention that we, in, with everything else that's gone on, we had a particularly interesting event this past month, which was, I believe, for the first time ever, a visit from a sitting president of the United States. Uh, was in town, I think, about a week ago, if I, my memory serves me right. The time, you, I lose track of time. But I really want to acknowledge the work of the police department in that visit. Uh, we, for, for, I think also for the first time in the history of the police department, or at least the modern day history, uh, every single police officer was on duty for that event. There was no one off for training, there was no one out sick, there was no one on vacation. Every single police officer was here, no one turned down the overtime. And, you know, I think it says a lot about our police department. And, you know, while it was a private visit and, uh, you know, not many people knew in advance the president was going to be here, you know, I, it's still nice when the president of the United States, you know, is in your community and is seeing it. And, you know, I, I heard, amongst other things, when I think everyone's aware, he had a, a fundraising event uh, down at the Monk's property. And Chief Williams was telling me a little bit about it afterward. And one of the things the president did when he was there is in front of their home, there's a private beach. And he, he, he un, unplanned, on un whatever, he walked down to the beach uh, uh, there at the Monk's property. So, you know, I, I think, you know, we've heard, we've heard a lot of things about the community that we can be proud of this evening, people we can feel good about. But, you know, that, that was just one other thing this past month that, you know, no matter what one's political affiliation, and, you know, the president didn't have the best week this week, but, you know, we know he had a good week the week before when he was in Cape Elizabeth, so I think we can all feel good about that. Uh, just the, the one other thing I did want to mention is, you know, we are celebrating a lot of things. There's, there's one really important thing we're not celebrating, uh, and that is an, an anniversary on December 1st of this year, which is the 50th anniversary of the acquisition of Fort Williams by the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. And, Penny Jordan sitting here. Her father was one of the five members of the Board of Selectmen who were involved in that. It was a citizen vote in July, but it was on December 1st, 1964, that the town acquired Fort Williams. And if there's anything I think we can look at in this community that has had more citizen involvement, more debate, more discussion, and I think most people would, would 
agree that because of that citizen involvement, citizen discussion, it's a much better place because of it. Uh, again, I think it's, it's something we can really feel good as a community. So uh, everyone should celebrate in their own way. There's no special festivities, but next time you go into the park, I think you, you know, you're not only look at the beauty there, but you think of all the, all the good citizen volunteers, the Henry Adams, the, the Billy Jordans, the uh, Penny Carsons, I could go on and on. I shouldn't stop mentioning names of, uh, you know, Jim is a, another one that's had a lot to do with the recent history of the park. Everyone can feel good about it as a community, so. Good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> draft minutes were um, inadvertently left out of your packet, so we will review and approve those at the December Council meeting. <clears throat> and on to uh, the next item, which is a public hearing on roosters. I'd like to remind the public that um, we will have uh, that this, this public hearing will now take place. Um, if you would please keep your individual comments to three minutes, you will be timed, um, and that we shall remain at all times courteous. So I will now open the public hearing. So whoever would like to come and speak, please line up and come to the podium. And we need your name and address. Uh, I'm Joe Guida. Uh, I'm also related to the son. My son lives in uh, uh, the neighborhood that's currently affected. But um, I live in the Broad Cove section at 13 Spoon Drift Lane. Um, first, uh, I haven't been involved in terms of the things that you do until recently. But the last four or five months, I've been able to participate in this. And I get a, a true appreciation for the work you do. Uh, and it's not always easy. And for that, you have our thanks. Uh, because I, I think you have some tough decisions to make. Um, what I wanted to do was just describe from my perspective uh, what I believe to be a sensible solution to this. Uh, I'm here clearly to speak in, in support of the lot restriction. Uh, we moved to the Broad Cove section a number of years ago. Last year we had uh, new neighbors move in next to us. Our houses are 30 feet apart. Uh, we live on less than a half an acre of land. They promptly installed chickens. Uh, the chickens are wonderful. Uh, they're, they're, uh, we love having them there, but obviously they're not <coughs> noisy as a rooster would be. Uh, the reason I'm speaking about this is that I think that there's a logical uh, solution to this particular issue. And actually, I learned from Chief Williams several uh, months ago when he was speaking about this, because I thought he brought a sensible solution to this particular situation. Just four brief points. One is about a rooster. Its nature is to crow. Uh, it does it to stake out its turf. It does it to stake a claim on its area. It does it, it you cannot reason with a rooster. You can't train a rooster. You can't scold a rooster. You can't bring a rooster inside as you can a dog, which I think the chief explained when his dogs get a little noisy, he's able to bring them inside and, and certainly uh, quiet them down. The collars appear not to work. It was quoted in the Press Herald a while ago that the, the, the rooster either went berserk or something when the collar was placed on it, so collars are really not an issue. Uh, number two, it's been suggested uh, by some that this ordinance be, uh, that this issue be addressed under the noise ordinance. Uh, Police Chief Williams, very well a month ago, said it, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't mean to attempt to quote him, but he indicating that enforcing a noise violation is very time consuming for his officers and very inefficient. Uh, the public doesn't want to bother an officer with repeated calls. They don't want to be hitting 911 every 15 minutes as the rooster starts to go about its business, which is really unrestricted. And a noise, a noise ordinance requires just that. If the noise ordinance was the solution, it would have been fixed by now because this problem has been going on for months and months and months. The police have been called, and yet we find ourselves here today still struggling to find a solution to this. Uh, the third point is, again, Chief Williams so perfectly stated, if there exists in nature such a thing as a quiet rooster, uh, there's no complaint. There's no complaint. There's no police officer going there. If a rooster is there and he's quiet, uh, roosters go on and there's no agenda. My last issue is it's been suggested by some people that the lot restriction is an issue with anti-farm. Nothing could be further from the truth. Turkey Hill Farm is within earshot of my house. They have roosters, but it's a long ways away. We don't have any trouble, and I love having the farm there. 
Six months is too long. I encourage you to listen to the logic that was provided by Chief Williams as to the solution, which is if the rooster thing is there, that it can be resolved rather quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I, I apologize, I neglected to mention or identify the public hearing as it is, this public hearing is on a proposal to limit roosters to be kept only on lots over 40,000 square feet. So anyway, I needed to say that. Nick, would anyone else like to speak? My name is Penny Pollard. I live at 3 Peoples Point Lane. Um, I'm not here to speak on behalf of any particular uh, rooster owner, uh, but I do regard Cape Elizabeth as a rural community. I respect it as a rural community uh, and its long history of rural activities. I don't like to think of it as a suburb. So uh, it concerns me when a potential ordinance would go into effect because of uh, uh, what might have been one or two complaints about uh, a long-held rural activity in the town. So I support things that have to do with our town that uh, encourage its rural demeanor. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Joe Guida, 15 Farm Hill Road. My dad was more thorough than I would have been and more prepared, um, so he actually covered most of what I wanted to talk about. Um, I think I've explained in the past what the experience was like, and I kind of don't want to harp on that. It was unpleasant. Uh, it's just, you know, the, the lots that we're looking at are a fifth of an acre, anything under a quarter of an acre. I mean, the rooster is basically right on top of you. Um, there were times when I would sit <coughs> on my deck and the thing is where Councillor Walsh is sitting, constantly growing. It's just, it's like an assault. Um, I fully agree that there is a long farming history of Cape Elizabeth and I am thankful that what you've proposed is restricted to simply small lots. Uh, it's not gonna affect the farming community in one bit and I think that's very important. Um, so I, I really urge you to protect the neighborhoods and protect the quality of life in small neighborhoods like ours. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leona Fitzgerald. I live at 60 Long Point Lane. I don't know that I'll have anything incredibly motivational to say. I'm sure I'll think of something great in the middle of the night tonight, but I certainly understand the issue at hand. There's no denying that roosters can be very noisy and they don't just crow in the morning, they crow for as long as it's light out. I have roosters. Um, I don't feel that the proposed ordinance is a solution. I think it's too much of a blanket um, coverage that doesn't, it's too, I just don't think it'll work. Um, or it would work, I just don't think it's the right solution. Uh, to me, the. It, it comes down to an issue of being a good neighbor, using common sense, and when all else fails, have it be the noise issue as the solution or the attempt at a solution. Um, and at the very least, I would like to propose that if the ordinance does pass, that there's um, some sort of exemption application process because using myself as an example, again, I do have roosters. I live in a lot that is not quite 40,000 feet but I'm surrounded on three sides by completely wooded, uninhabited um, woods for acres and acres. And I have one neighbor and my roosters don't bother her at all. So and it may sound crazy, but the roosters are an integral part of our family. And uh, I just think it would be very unfortunate if we had to get rid of our roosters because of a issue that's, you know, a few issues in town that seem to be a chronic problem. And yay for the library. <laughs> Thank you.
Your name and address, please. Um, my name is Patrick Kennedy. I live at uh, 17 Farm Hall Road. Thank you. Um, what rooster? Um, it's funny because, you know, when we got rid of our rooster, um, my daughter was sitting there sobbing. The rooster was part of our family. Try to find the humor in getting rid of your pet. It's funny how experience changes perspective. Um, my knee-jerk common sense opinion about roosters was that roosters were too loud to keep. Experience and reality changes perspectives, and it changed mine. The problem with common sense is that it's based on assumptions, prejudice, hearsay, fear, based, uh, fear-based social conformity at all. It's cerebral, not knee-jerk. My dad told me a story about when he was uh, going to college. He lived in Lowell, near a train, uh, near train tracks. When he came back from college, the trains kept him up for two weeks. Eventually, they became background noise again. That story has a name in psychology. It's called habituation. Another person wrote me a handwritten letter and described me, uh, to me how they kept chickens during World War II for eggs in England and how they quickly became pets and how it was difficult to let them go and to slaughter them for food. <clears throat> To the outside observer, based on assumptions that roosters are louder than dogs, which they're not, or crows, which are not, or extrapolating from the idea that farm animals need acres of land to humanely exist in a residential setting, as in for horses, presents obstacles to habituation. It's a choice, to the point where it's cerebral and no longer a matter of knee-jerk habituation. The reality is, that my lot is more than sufficient in size to make animals uh, and chickens happy. Um, the reality is that once uh, we were down to the right ratio of roosters to hens, the frequency and duration of crowing dropped dramatically. The reality is that I recorded many animals on my iPhone with the decibel meter louder than my roosters before my rooster started crowing in the morning inside of its soundproofed coop, which is some place where you can put your rooster if it's crowing too loud. Um, the town council, uh, to a town council and other communities precedent might seem to make uh, such a rule make sense. But there's precedents though that have been unconstitutional based on prejudice, discrimination, exaggerated stereotypes and lies. There's been a lot of exaggerated claims about how loud a rooster is. It's half as loud as a jackhammer. And our rooster was not crowing every 15 minutes, sometimes hours between crowing and five minutes at a time, most of the time. If you could finish up, Mr. Kennel, okay. you're, all, you're all set. Um, the other part of this is it takes six months before chickens uh, raise from eggs will lay eggs. And sometimes, uh, despite what other people have said, it's not always possible to tell when a rooster is going to crow until they lay an egg or they crow. Five out, of, five out of six of our chicks were roosters. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Beth Engel. I live at Three Young Lane in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I am a real estate broker, a chicken farmer, and a dairy heifer farmer. I know a lot about chickens and a lot about roosters. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about listening to you guys here is that one of the things that's so wonderful about our town was listening to Beach to Beacon. We have such 
a huge diversity of people in this town. We have world-class artists. Uh, Nina Fuller just took the most beautiful portrait of Barack Obama I've ever seen. She's from here. We have Beach to Beacon. We've got world-class scholars and world-class educators and world-class farmers. Our community is very, very different than other communities in Cumberland County. We really, I think, embrace our agriculture here. We are allowed to keep chickens and roosters and goats and sheep. We have a lot of homesteaders in this town, which I kind of think we really need to think about. They are on small lots. They raise, when you get 34 meat chickens, they're chicks. Of those 34, 15 of them are roosters. They all go to slaughter at 11 weeks, 10 weeks. They're going to crow for about a week. Um, egg chickens, the roosters. You want to raise egg chickens, you've got to have at least one rooster. You want to make more egg chickens. You can do that easily on less than 40,000 square feet. I think we have a lot of people who do. I don't think I would keep more than one, maybe two roosters with a small flock. You're going to have trouble. But that one rooster and your entire flock has to go in at night, every night. If they're not in at sundown and out at 6 a.m., they will be eaten by coyotes. So everyone who has roosters puts them in at night. I'm here to tell you, a rooster crowing inside a barn is nothing like a dog barking inside a house. You can hardly hear them. Once they go out at 6 a.m., if you've got a bird flying over like a hawk, your rooster's going to crow. But it doesn't sound like a dog. It doesn't sound like a lawnmower. It doesn't, it's not as loud as a tree cutter or a truck going by. It's a daytime sound which is no louder than all other sounds of our daily lives. So yes, it can be a little annoying to get used to them. The issue here is are we going to throw the baby out with the bathwater? You get rid of chickens or roosters on lots of 40,000 square feet and less, what is going to be your next animal? It sounds to me like the rooster in question is gone. So either the noise ordinance or the neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor issue got resolved without an ordinance restricting roosters. So I think you need to be careful about changing the landscape of this town. Because if you start with, no, you can't have any roosters, rather than if you've got a rooster, it's got to be in at dark and out at 6 AM, then you are going to start restricting other animals. I promise you will change the agriculture nature of this town. My daughter started in 4-H in this town, and she now works for a major dairy industry in Wisconsin. She started with a rooster. So I think you need to think long and hard before you kick them out of town. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Crystal Kennedy, and I live at 17 Farm Hill Road. Um, I'd like to start by saying to Mike McGovern um, that you're correct with what you've said in um, newspaper articles and interviews that this isn't just about us and our rooster. This is about the whole town. And that's it. It's not about us anymore. It affects all of Cape Elizabeth residents including residents like us that want to have a backyard flock, including a rooster, but can't afford to have a large lot of land. Passing an ordinance like the one being recommended sets a precedent that, that the town is unwilling to meet in the middle, and unless you have money, you're not allowed certain rights. I'm sure you all know that animals can be therapeutic. That goes for any animal, including roosters. My dog, Toby, was my companion in reassurance through an abusive relationship. He continues to be that as we deal with the same abusive man. That's what the chickens have done for me. 
after months of serious illness, losing my position at work, and having to contend with an abuser that should be in jail, the chickens were and are a peaceful and therapeutic thing for me. With caring for them from chicks and feeding them by hand, or being able to laugh at Elvis's personality, we no longer have Elvis because he was starting to attack our Toby. But we came tonight to continue to speak against the ordinance being voted on tonight because we still believe it's not a good compromise. This has been an eye-opening experience and one I'm glad my husband and I stuck up for even though there have been repercussions. Our daughter being picked on at school, rude emails from people we don't know, our neighbors criticizing what our yard looks like and yelling out to my husband as we, he sat on our porch that he's an idiot. But my husband says we are raising kids, not grass. If you have a problem with our yard, come talk to us. You may have your own eye-opening experience. The same thing should have been done about the rooster. But good has come to us as well. Neighbors we didn't know have stopped by or mailed us letters in support and with nice comments showing us we are not completely surrounded by liars and negativity. The last thing I'd like to say is to Kathy Ray. At the last meeting, Joe thanked you for coming out to listen to the noise. And you told a reporter you sat there for 15 minutes listening. Why not call or knock on our door? Why not explain the situation and come in and spend time to listen from our point of view? It's not like we could have asked the roosters to be quiet while you were sitting there. The town council wanted to not do the Brewster ban because they wanted neighbors to be neighborly, so it seems like the town council should also um, practice what they preach. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at the public hearing? Hi there, I'm uh, Penny Jordan and I'm one of the owners of Jordan's Farm at 21 Wells Road in Cape Elizabeth. And I'm not here to talk about farming history. I'm, I'm here to talk about, as I, as I listen tonight and I think about uh, the 250th anniversary of our town, and I think about what brought us here and what brought many of the people who are sitting here on the town council to this town, uh, it's because we've created a town based on deep thinking. And you may think a rooster ordinance isn't about deep thinking, but it's about consideration. It's about really thinking about when we make a decision, what are the ramifications? What are the long-term impacts? Um, some of the words that I've heard people speak uh, Blanket solutions. Blanket solutions are easy. Uh, if we step back and we really say, um, what is it? We can think about a simple solution of 40,000 square feet less than, and we can put that out there. Uh, or we can step back and say, let's look at, when we say less than 40,000 square feet, where might the various impacts be? So I'm not saying that people should have to listen to uh, roosters crowing at 6 a.m. What I'm saying is that as you sit there and you do your job, that maybe what you want to think about is stepping back, saying what are the long-term impacts? Because as Beth said, you can start with a rooster but eventually you're going to go to other animals. And you may not think that, uh, oh, we'll never think about dogs, we'll never think about cows, we'll never think about pigs, we'll never think about something else. But each decision comes with a long-term impact. So as I think about why we're here, we've created a town that thinks about what they're doing, thinks about the solution, and doesn't necessarily think about the easy answer. And I think the easy answer is, let's make a blanket statement of less than 40,000 square feet. I think I would recommend to the town council, step back, look at the full ramifications, and make a decision accordingly. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to uh, 
speak during the public hearing. Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing. Item number 132, Roosters. The Town Council will consider public hearing comments on rooster regulation. So, councillors, do you have any comments? Do you want a motion first? or are we going I, I will entertain a motion. And I have the original language if you'd like it, or Councillor Ray. Um, you said, I'm sorry, what did you just say? I will entertain a motion. Yes, okay. Um, I move that, I don't have the wording. I, I have it. You want to pass it down? Thank you. Okay. Um, I move that we recommend a change to the miscellaneous offenses ordinance that prohibits roosters on lots of less than 40,000 square feet in size. Is there a second? Seconded. Council Walsh. Discussion. Councilor Sherman. The motion was that we recommend a change. Is it that we would be adopting the proposed change to the ordinance to uh, ban roosters on lots of 40,000 square feet or less? I mean, I just, I'm not being, maybe I'm being over, overly technical, but. No, no, I was, I was trying to pick okay. up, oh, okay. and it wasn't completely clear. Yeah, I would assume the motion We would this, adopt the amendment would, to, to the to Animal the, Control okay. Ordinance, right. Section 12-1-2. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Comments? Yes, Councilor Sherman. Uh, I, I appreciate everybody coming out here this evening. Um, it, to me, this is a, an issue that affects residential neighborhoods within our town. Uh, it affects lots of 40,000 square feet or less, although that is 60% of the lots in our town. It is only 11% of the land in our town, and it certainly is not going to impact the ability of a farm to have roosters. I, I would never want to adopt a change to our ordinance that would affect our farm's abilities to function and be economically viable. Um, but in my opinion, roosters just simply do not belong in residential neighborhoods where houses are close together. Uh, it, it seems pretty simple to me. And the 40,000 square feet just didn't come out of nowhere. The, the planning board thought long and hard about that. The council has. Uh, the, the, the goal here is to prevent roosters from living in a neighborhood where your neighbors are going to hear them crowing. Um, you, you know, I, I'm very sorry if the Kennedys uh, were mistreated uh, or feel they were mistreated by uh, their neighbors. I'm sure like a lot of these conflicts, there are two sides to every story. Um, but you know, my view is if a neighbor is complaining to you that your pet is uh, interfering with their ability to enjoy their own property, you have to think long and hard about whether you're going to keep it. And I know many people in the past, including some family members, have, when faced with complaints about a rooster, said, gee, we hate to do this, but we've got to get rid of the rooster. And I remember my cousin sobbing as the rooster was taken away to a, a farm or some other place where you take roosters. Um, so I know it's hard for your family to, to and it sounds like you already had to give up your pet, and I know that's hard. Uh, but I, I think the reason we're, I'm prepared to vote in favor of this ordinance is this issue is just going to keep popping up. Uh, the backyard chicken movement is, uh, seems to be growing stronger, and I'm all for that. But if you have neighbors that are being affected by a rooster crowing, it, it seems to me that <coughs> the rooster loses in that equation. And uh, you know, there are plenty of other types of pets that can bring comfort in a time of need. And, and roosters just are different. They crow, they make noise, they disturb neighbors, and, and that's why I'm going to vote in favor of this. I don't think it detracts at all from our rural heritage. I voted in the past for agricultural zoning amendments to help our farms more viable. But to me, this is affecting neighborhoods, and that's why I'm voting in favor of it. Councilor Wagner. Yeah, first I'd like to say I'm sympathetic to both sides of this debate and uh, the rooster owners in the town. I, I'm sorry for the impact of this ordinance if it's, if it's passed. Um, you know, two of the biggest issues in this town in the last year have to do with noise. You know, one is the gun club, this one is roosters. And uh, the gun club's been in this town for over 50 years and they're having to respond to the fact that they live uh, they're, they're sited close to a residential neighborhood as well. So, and that's what the, the council ends up dealing with uh, proximity issues often. Um, 
this town is no longer, we're about to celebrate our 250th anniversary, but this town is not like it was 250 years ago. Uh, this community is evolved, and I, I, I don't see it as a simple issue. I think it's, it's difficult for me, but, um, and I, I, I had an answer when I was a kid, too, when I was at Central Maine. Um, but that being said, I, I think, given the complexity of this town and the nature of its uh, residential neighborhoods, that I'm, I'm inclined to vote for this ordinance change. Jordan? Well, I obviously disagree with most of you. Um, right now, I don't see a pressing issue in having to push this through tonight. We had one issue come up. Elvis has been sent away. So we don't need to rush into making this blanket ordinance that's going to affect a lot of people in town. I think we should step back. Yeah. Just feedback. Step, we should step back and look at all the different options that we can take in doing this. Can we regulate it with noise? When we're about to have our town council goals, and one of my goals is going to be to see if we can find volunteer mediators to work on neighbor-neighbor issues in town, because it seems to be a lot of neighbor-neighbor issues coming before the town, and we're making blanket ordinances to address issues that are isolated incidences, and I don't think that's a precedent we should continue to be setting. I do agree that it's going to be a slippery slope. Maybe this council here does not agree that they're going to ever ban cows or pigs or sheep or goats, but a rooster is the first step. If right now, you can have a backyard animal. And what happens when a neighbor decides that a, you know, a pig is making too much noise? We are going to lose the hold on being a royal community that we have been so proud of that it is basically iron stamped into our comprehensive plan that this is going to be an agricultural community with this historic history in farming and fishing. Rural is written all over the comprehensive plan. That is the basis of what we are talking about right here. And Jamie brings up the gun club being 50 years old and having to deal with noise. No, they're not having to deal with noise, they're having to deal with safety. So I just want to push that aside. Right? We're talking about a noise issue. Yes, we need to revamp the noise ordinance. Let's look at that. We need to revamp animal control. Fine, but making a blanket statement banning roosters from 40,000 square foot lots. What happens to the 50,000 square foot lots or the 60,000 square foot lots? Why aren't we looking at distances from property lines? We have a very large property, but our chicken coop is held right on the lot line. So it could, our neighbors could complain just as much as the neighbors in, over here with the Kennedys and, and Joe, sorry, I can't pronounce your last name. But it's not addressing the actual issue. Noise is the issue. Let's relook at the ordinance and look at what we can do about the noise problem or look at what we can do for neighbor-neighbor relations. This is not the answer. We are affecting a lot more citizens than we realize. I understand we've gotten a lot of emails that maybe there are other issues out there with roosters that people have ignored. So let's not ignore this, but let's not just throw a blanket answer at it because we've heard from one lady who this is not a problem for her, but it's going to be a huge issue when you tell her she either has to get rid of her roosters that she's kept for years or blatantly break the law that we're going to pass tonight. That is not a fair position to be putting our citizens in to ask them to break the law when there's no problem with their property. Um, Caitlin, can I ask you a question? You realize that what almost what two years ago this exact same issue was in front of this council? Yes, I do. Okay, this, and, and we didn't address it then. We backed off completely because in that case the rooster went away. I'm not asking us to back off. Okay, so here we are two years later. We didn't deal with it two years ago and now it's back in front of us. So I, I just want you to understand that at some point, there is a question of, of how we as counselors need to act. And we've, I, you know, I don't want to hear just, it was just one rooster. This happened two years ago. So, and if I remember correctly, some of the argument then was we uh, were addressing it as part of the noise ordinance and the specific um, language addressing agriculture was going to get changed. And that's why the final lines, Alliance was so worried about it, because they felt that that time it started the slippery slope. This ordinance committee addressed that very question and talked at length about 
doing it as an ordinance for noise, and determined that it wasn't going to work for the obvious reasons you're using as one of your arguments, that it's just the first step. Now, I, the other piece I want to get to on this neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor thing, now, I like this, the, the possibility of doing this arbitration piece because, as I've said, I never thought I would ever be on a council where we have been arbitrating, in many ways, neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor relationships. And one thing we did two years ago was short-term rentals. And that was everything from traffic to noise to people urinating off their decks to, I mean, you name it, okay? And at some point, if we didn't address that the way we did, today we would still have the same problems in these neighborhoods that were, that were really occupying a lot of air time. So I'm at, I'm at a point where I'm, I'm confused about what you're asking us to do because we have a problem that, is a, that needs to be addressed in small neighborhoods. And we've looked at alternatives, and this seems to be the one that is the most workable. And barring some you know, revelation or something that somebody can bring to me that would make me feel differently, I'm in favor of moving forward with this. And, and I just, I'm a little worried that we're going to press the pause button on something that is now come to us for the second time. And if this neighbor, is, these neighbors got along, it never would have come to us and everything would be fine, but they didn't. And we need to address this issue. I think as counselors, we have a fiduciary responsibility to act. And that's what I'm prepared to do this evening. Thank you, Council Walsh. Any comments over here, Council Ray? Yes, um, thank you. Um, I'm an animal lover. I'm one of those people that doesn't step on the ant. I mean, that's, that's kind of sad, but that's who I am. And um, Councillor Sherman sent out an email today to uh, one of the people that was concerned. And the email was wonderful. And it really summarized everything, but, and I won't read it because it's his to read if he wishes. But um, I, uh, being on the ordinance committee, I learned a lot about roosters. I learned a lot from um, Councillor Wagner, who had uh, experience with roosters. And we went through a lot of iterations. This was not a blanket solution. This was not an attempt to get and do anything to the ag agricultural farming community in Cape Elizabeth. And, um, you know, I, I think when, if anybody attended the Ordinance Committee, they would have saw us, seen us gone through all kinds of different iterations. Well, how old is the rooster? When is it crow? What can we do? Blah, 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 blah. In an attempt to try to work out a solution and um, I'm comfortable with where we, where we landed. And, uh, you know, I, it's not a slippery slope. This is not an attempt to do anything to the farming community, um, ever, on my part. And I don't think it was on anybody else's either. Um, I heard about rude emails from people that they don't know. <clears throat> We get lots of rude emails from people we don't know. Lots of them. And I just want to, you know, bring that up because I think it's important. Not everybody knows that. But um, we, we get really nasty emails. Um, and I appreciate emails that we get that are thoughtful, that we listen to, you know, and hear people. But um, anyway, I wanted you to know that. And uh, the other thing is, is um, I don't think our ca the counselor's job is to enforce um, the issue or to negotiate between neighbors, but to understand the issue and try to do what we can within our aspects and our authority. So um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, support the this uh, ordinance. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, uh, we went through all kinds of different questions. I think that we were very thoughtful as an ordinance committee in trying to look at all different pieces of it. How could we deal with this and how could we do this and should we do that? And we went through a whole bunch of things. And the police chief, uh, I thought, was very helpful to us because as counselors, I don't think we always understand about the enforcement piece. 
And um, I think we sometimes come up with what we think are great ideas. And sometimes they're not great ideas because they're not enforceable. And um, uh, Chief Williams was helpful to us in saying, OK, great idea. How am I going to enforce that? You know, am I going to park a police car next to this house and you know, listen for this amount of time and try to measure these decibels? And uh, one more thing that people have uh, written to us about and I think is important is people talk about dogs. And they've talked about disturbing the peace. And the one thing that keeps coming back to me on those issues are they are controllable by humans, by people. Um, we do have an ordinance that deals with barking dogs. And it's interesting because we get a lot of emails from people that seem to think that we don't deal with barking dogs. Well, I say go online and look at the ordinance, because we do. Um, do we all want to complain about our neighbors? No, it's hard. Um, it's a hard thing to do. Um, do I want to complain about my neighbors? No. Uh, but we do have a barking dog ordinance. And so if there is an issue with a barking dog, you can follow through with the police. If you have, I, I would suggest you try to deal with your neighbor, but um, sometimes that doesn't work. I think we know that. Um, so um, you can call the police. And we also have a disturbing the peace provision. So um, you're having a loud party or whatever. We have, um, we have timelines that are involved. So, um, we do deal with some of these things, and I, I think uh, folks have said, well, you know, uh, put roosters in that same category. Uh, you, you can't sit down and talk to a rooster about being noisy after 10 o'clock, you know, 10 p.m. Okay, you know, you got to stop crowing. Um, that's not going to work. So, um, anyway, uh, I don't want to get people going, but um, uh, that's my position, and I. I never like to upset people. Um, I don't want to cause trouble, but I am going to support this ordinance. Okay. Any other comments? Council Wagner? Just one follow up. Uh, I know Mr. Kennedy mentioned the uh, it take five or six months before he realized the gender of a chick. Uh, we did discuss that and with Chief Williams specifically. And there's never any intent of this ordinance change to enforce someone's lack of knowledge regarding the gender of a chick. And um, so if you think like you buy, it, you get a chick that it's one day old, that there's gonna be an enforcement action, cer certainly not gonna happen here. It would be once the person realized and they had the time to find an appropriate home, that would be fine. Thank you. Council Jordan? We keep talking about how this is not going to affect the farming community. And I just wanna point out that it's always been my understanding my entire life living here that Cape Elizabeth was the farming community. It's not just the property owned by the Jordans and the Maxwells and the Chads, but the Spragues and the Coxes. Every piece of property in this town has the potential and should have the right and the opportunity to be part of the farming community. That's the whole point of Cape Elizabeth. We are a farming community. That includes the entire town. I am not asking for us to just pause the rooster issue. I'm asking for us to step back, maybe have a sit down with the Cape Farm Alliance and work out why we stopped two years ago because the language wasn't right. Where we're picking up now is not right. It is not the way that we should be regulating citizens' rights to use their property. It is going to affect so many more people than we even can comprehend. I truly believe we are just going with the easiest answer here. Just because this is the most easy ordinance for the police to enforce does not mean it's the correct one. There are many different options that we could go with. We can have roosters are allowed. You can have it so that if there's a complaint, then there's a step. If there are two complaints, <coughs> rooster has to go. There's just different things that I think that we could be looking at if we just step back and have a sit down with rooster owners in the community, with chicken owners, people who want to have small micro homestead farms, whatever you'd like to call them or refer them to. I do not see a pressing matter that this needs to be passed tonight. There's no reason why we can't step back, sit down with some people, the people that came here tonight and shared that they have roosters, let's talk to them. There's no reason to push this forward tonight. 
Okay. No other comments? Uh, I have some comments. Um, I think that we find ourselves in the position, as Council Walsh has said, uh, so often uh, dealing with neighbor disputes. Uh, you don't need roosters to have laying hens. Um, I think that it's unfortunate to have uh, a rooster on such a tiny lot, knowing that, or with the potential of, of um, causing your neighbors to not be able to have the quiet enjoyment of their property. I don't accept the slippery slope argument. I would like to point out that our current ordinances restrict uh, livestock, such as horses, cows, pigs, goats, to property that has at least 100,000 square feet. For commercial feet. purposes only. Read the step before that. Agriculture is allowed. Agriculture provided that no animal or fowl shall be raised for commercial purposes. But I do think there's a two and a half acre law, uh, restriction. Are you saying it's the same? I would love to take a step back and look at that before we vote on this. Because right now, I do believe you can have a cow, you can have a pig on any lot size for non-commercial purposes. This is a slippery slope. Well, excuse me, Councilor Jordan. So, section C of that is actually non-commercial. And so... Yeah, non-commercial. Well, it's still restricted. So, what? anyway, I'd like to continue on. I think that... Uh, I think that it's unfortunate, but here we are in this position. I was on the council with some of our other, my other colleagues here several years ago when we had the same issue. Um, this is not an isolated event. Um, and as so, Councilor Sherman so eloquently wrote in his response today, this is, um, this is a very common problem and other communities are, have dealt with this and restricted uses on small housing lots. And even though Cape Elizabeth has a very rural character and history, we have many homes and lo uh, homes that are on tiny lots. And I think therein lies the issue. The Ordinance Committee unanimously approved this uh, proposal. Um, it's been reviewed by the Planning Board. We are back here again where we were several years ago. The problem isn't going to go away. And I think that the solution here is reasonable. It's a starting point. You have to draw a line somewhere. You know, is it possible a rooster might be near property line on a much larger lot? Sure. But I think that this is a very reasonable uh, approach to this problem, and I will be supporting this. Uh, I was going to close comment, but go ahead. I was just going to ask if Caitlin wanted to move to table until next month. I would love to move to table this next month. I just need somebody to second it. I'll second. Not debatable. It's not debatable. Just move to a vote. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? Just move to a vote. It's not debatable. Uh, so move to a vote. On the motion to table. On the motion to table. Uh, so uh, it's been motion, moved and seconded. All those in favor of a motion to table. Those opposed. The motion fails. We have the primary motion on the table that was seconded to uh, adopt the proposed amendment. So I'll call the vote on that. All those, all those in favor. And those opposed. The motion carries. I'd like, we have a next item, number 133, the school binding request, uh, request, but I would suggest a three minute stretch break because <laughs> it's been a long evening so far.
Okay, thank you very much. Stretch break we all needed. Item number 133, the school bonding request. It is proposed to set a public hearing for Monday, December 8, 2014 at 7 p.m. on a proposal from the Cape Elizabeth School Board to bond several projects in 2015. What I'd like to do at this moment is turn this over to our finance chair, Jim Walsh, Council Walsh. Uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, Jessica. Uh, what you have in front of you is a rather lengthy document um, which was prepared uh, for today's meeting, and I'm going to move that we, um, we uh, move the school bonding request to a public hearing on Monday, December 8, 2014, at 7 p.m. I think it's important to um, recognize the fact that this is five projects that came forward uh, from the school board, five separate projects, all under $1 million, which based on our charter is why I, I bring that to everyone's attention. So I am moving uh, to the school board bonding request to a public hearing on Monday, December 8, 2014. Thank you, Council Walsh. Um, uh, Council Sherman. Second. Second. Okay. Any, I, I would like to say that the, the uh, uh, school board chairman and, and finance chair are planning to make a presentation to this council at our December 8 meeting. Um, but anyway, are there any comments or questions? Jessica, should we recognize the uh, school yes. Would you, yes. personnel? Yes, thank you. Well, I, I'm going <laughs> to leave that to you. You're the chair. <laughs> thank you. And we have with us the superintendent of schools, Meredith Neto. We have um, the school fi board finance chair, Michael Moore. We have our new Scott Wyman. Scott, Scott, I'm sorry, Scott Wyman. Our our new I, what is what is this title? Business manager. Business manager. Sorry, sorry about that, Mr. Wyman. I'm just uh, having a brain cramp. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, Greg. and Greg Marles, our facilities director. So, any comments or questions? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 134, draft agreement with the Cape Elizabeth Town, uh, I'm sorry, Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society. The town council will consider approving a draft agreement with the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society for care of municipal bonds. I would like to ask the town manager to tell us briefly about this. He's, he's been working on this with us, our attorney. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Sullivan. This, uh, as you mentioned, I had, did work with it on a town attorney. I uh, worked with the, the Historical Preservation Society, and they also had a, a pro bono attorney, Bob Raftis, uh, assisted them as they reviewed this. And, and what this provides is that uh, they will continue to have an area that the town provides uh, for, for a set term uh, through 2019. Uh, it could be terminated with notice of either party. Uh, and it also, the, there's, there's certain requirements for the care of public <coughs> records that, that they have that are within their possession. Uh, the plan is, is uh, the end of the month, early December, uh, we, we maybe or maybe not having a, a meeting tomorrow to discuss moving days, uh, <laughs> at which uh, they'll be moving to the police station out of the library temporarily, and then we'll be looking, uh, either they'll be staying there or they won't be going back into the, old li the new library building. Uh, but there'll be, uh, you know, they, there's possibilities to may go back to this, the former library building, the Spurring School. But you know, the good thing about this is that we've had a relationship with them for about 25 years, and this is the formalizing of the informal relationship for 25 years. So I would encourage you to authorize me to sign the agreement. Thank you. Any comments or? Well, actually, let me entertain a motion. Let me entertain a motion first, please. Councilor Ray. I move to accept uh, the records management agreement between the town of Cape Elizabeth and the Cape Elizabeth Historic Preservation Society. Is there a second? Councilor McCausland. Okay. Any discussion? Councilor Wagner. The only question I had of Mike is whether or not there was any discussion about uh, digitizing any of these records. Uh, there's not, we're talking about digitizing other records, not specific to these. Some of these, are, they're in their possession, they're responsible for them. The, the other books that we have, they, they ought to be digitized at some time, but they're, they're old, uh, the mic's going up, old treasurer's books that are 
you know, that about yay thick and yay big. So, but it, you know, at some point, all of those public records should be. <coughs> a lot of them are, you know, assessment books, and but it would be good to see that sometime. We'll look into it. Anyone else, Councilor Cosa? Mike, I have two questions. One is, are there any issues with privacy? And two is, are there any issues with accessibility? And uh, will there be staffing available if there's a need to have those items available to the public other than Thursday mornings or whatever the normal time is that the Historical Society folks are there? Uh, good questions. Uh, accessibility has actually improved. They will, because th it, that has a key card system, they'll have 24-7 access to it, which they now don't. Uh, they, they're giving me a list uh, any day now. I think they said they were going to send it to who's going to be eligible to be able to get into the room. Uh, for the, the public access, you know, you, you just can't, right as it is now, you can't have access all the time, but there are requirements in this agreement that it has to, you know, that it needs to be open every week uh, for everyone. And as it is now, you know, there's, the, for example, Ben McDougall needed a document today, and you'll he give one over. They happen to be there today, but we do uh, we do have the ability to to access the public records at any time uh, because th there are there are provisions in the state laws they have to be accessible. Exactly. Okay. Just, um, who um, who on the pa part of the historic society is signing this, and is it like a vote of a board trustees? They, they have a board. The president is a woman by the name of Dorothy Higgins, and that will be the signature I'll be looking for. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? I just had one last question, and they're on board with this. They yeah, I re I received a phone call from Bob Raftus, their attorney, yesterday, saying they had met again, and then actually Dorothy called me. Uh, yesterday to say they were on board with it. Okay. The only thing we, we do need to insert the square footage about that, so mm -hmm. we got to go measure it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 135, the annual update of the general assistance, uh, of, ge of general assist uh, assistance. The town council will hold a public hearing on the annual general assistance appendices. I will now open the public hearing. Does anyone wish to address the council on the general assistance appendices? Seeing, seeing no one, I will close the public hearing. I'd like to ask again the town manager if he'd just give us a brief update. I know there were some numbers that were changed on that. Yes, uh, this is an annual uh, recommendation that comes from the Maine Municipal Association consult in consultation with the Maine Department of Health and Human Services. It sets the overall maximum that someone can receive general assistance or local welfare. It also provides the food maximums, housing maximums, utility maximums, heating fuel maximums, personal care and household supplies. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's totally in keeping with uh, state law state law regulations. Okay. Do we vote on this? Yes, it's ready to that's on. On. Okay. After motion. Yep. Yeah. Uh, is there a motion to approve the annual update of general assistance appendices? Councilor Chairman? So moved. Is there a second? Seconded. Council Walsh, any further discussion? Council Walsh? Will we be signing this document this evening if this is voted? It's actually, even though they put the form there for you to sign it, it's not necessary for you to do that. They, they actually, they're okay with oh. my signature if you don't, unless okay. you really want to sign it. I'm fine with that, Michael. Okay. <laughs> okay. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Deb's got the form, though, so we can pass it around. So David can sign one last form. Yeah, one last form. He needs one to last sign. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, item number 136, update on mold in the town hall basement. And uh, again, I will ask the town manager to tell us about the situation. Yeah, thank you. And Greg Miles is here as well, the facilities manager. We've had a damp basement. Uh, for probably a hundred years, and you know, and you know, we've always wondered if there's mold. We've had to test it a couple of times. It's it's always come out negative for the bad molds until recently. Uh, Greg just had some tests done, and there were some bad molds. Uh, and he, he knows the technical terms. I, I don't know what they are. But let me. I think one of the reasons we're getting bad molds now, uh, and is that the fact that the basement. There's been a lot of closets and other things that 
don't get as much air circulation. And I think as it's become, you know, compartmentalized down there, we haven't had as much air circulation. So, so the molds grow and get nasty. Uh, the particular challenges are down there, we got, we've, we've already had them remove a lot of the special ed records. They've, they've already been uh, taken. The school department's dealt with that. It was the first place the mold was discovered. Uh, it was also the, if you, what's, the area that's, uh, as you could just go downstairs, it was once a cafeteria by the old <coughs> kitchen, if that means anything to anyone. Uh, it's also a meeting space. The, in about maybe 10 years ago, there was an area separated there, the technology department is. The really bad news is that area is bad and is, is not a place where it can be human habitation. It's bad for the servers. We, we really need to move the servers out of there. The good news is, is the fire department had a 911 room that's off the equipment bays where the telephone equipment was stored and 911 equipment, and we can move it there. But it's, it's a $35,000 cost, 30, a little over 30, but I'm guessing 35000 simply to move that equipment uh, from here to there. And we know we need that money to do that. It's, uh, it, it's got to be moved. And you know, the, the good thing is, is then, you know, and then there's, there's other mitigation that's now going on. It's going to have some expense. Greg's filed a claim for it. Uh, we have other records that, you know, back to your question, you know, we're going to be looking at digitizing some records. But there's other things that we, we store down there that we're just required to keep for seven years, for instance, old invoices and, you know, that type of thing. There's tax records, uh, there's permanent tax records, but then there's also the receipts and things we're required to keep for three or seven years. Mm -hmm. Seven years. And the plan is, is to move some of that. I, I'm not going to say where we're moving it, but we, we got to fix some other space in order to move it. And the reason I'm not saying where it is, because I don't want to broke it into and whatever, but we have some other places that Greg is planning to move those those things. But but again, it's going to require a little bit of uh, a little bit of upgrade, a little bit of improvements. You know, my guess is we could easily spend a hundred thousand dollars on this problem by the time we get done. I don't know if it's going to be that much, but. What I'd like to do is, is ask for the $35,000 tonight uh, out, of, out of the unassigned fund balance, which, which we're doing okay with revenues. We just got that eco main money, uh, whatever. But to, to ask for the $35,000 to take care of the server issue that is the server for the schools and the town, it, it's really important to be able to know we have the money to get that out. And then, and then you know, meanwhile, we're continuing to spend money on the mitigation. But at some point, I want to come back to you with a more complete report and probably ask for some more money and for you to evaluate all the, all the stuff that we would like to do that isn't the immediate emergency of, as far as you know, getting the space so that it, some of it is workable and functional, functioning. The other thing is the Cape Coria, which rents space from us, uh, also is similarly disadvantaged by this. and That's an issue we need to deal with. But, you know, it's not a good issue. The, the, you know, this space is fine, the office space is fine, but it would be good to get the mold out of the close proximity. So I want to, you know, Greg could add some technical details to it. Uh, I don't know uh, what you'd like to hear from him, but I'll... I'll uh, would anyone... I, I anyone sort of ask you at this point to appropriate $35,000 uh, from the unassigned fund balance for the purpose of relocating the service to the town center fire station. Is there a motion? So Council Walsh, second it. Council Wagner, any discussion or questions for Mike or Greg Marles? Council Walsh. <coughs> Michael, I understand that you have pursued an insurance question as well. Yeah, the, you know the insurance company, you know, might cover the mitigation, but they're not going to cover the, the other long-term stuff. And I'm not even sure if they're going to do that. Uh, but, but they're not going to, you know, for example, if we want to, you know, t you know, take the wall down and make that one big room again in, down in, you know, the cafeteria, they're not going to pay the money for the, the longer term improvements. They're simply going to pay for getting rid of the mold and mitigating it, getting rid of it, abating it, I guess. Mm -hmm. okay. Killing it. Council Wagner? Yeah. Uh, one on the insurance, typically insurance policies have $5,000. Yeah. Like I don't know if that's the case here. Yeah. But, um, the, the other question I had was about, um, I'm forgetting, um, oh, are you going to do an RFP on this or is there something that... You, For the moving of the servers? I mean, who, who's going to do it? Is it town's own people that are going to do it? I, I will do The town's own people are going to do it and I'll defer to Craig on uh, some of the other. Yeah, they paid. 
the uh, town tech staff is going to move a lot of it. We also have some contractors that are involved to do things like the electrical upgrades that are necessary and some of the uh, uh, construction parts that we have to do will be contracted out. Uh, there's a little bit we're doing in-house for some of that, but the majority of the uh, heavy lifting is going to be uh, contracted. Anyone else have a question for, for Greg Morales? No? Okay, thank you. All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right, item number 137, update on the bottle, on bottle shed recycling program. And one last time, I'll we'll ask the and, town and, manager. And, to and we have a citizen sitting in the front who might like to speak on this as well. But uh, the, the bottle, just a br brief explanation. The, the bottle shed is, is something that a lot of people appreciate, but in recent years, particularly amongst the, the booster groups at the schools, uh, they've moved uh, on to a lot of them participate in the Clink program through Hannaford. Uh, and, you know, the, the difficulty is the parents are very devoted within season uh, to help it, but then, you know, the, there's only so much availability within seasons, and, you know, Deb has worked on this thing for years, Bob Malley, and, you know, we, we were only getting like six show up. This gentleman, I don't want to speak for him, take away his thunder, but he's with Lions Club. You know, and one thing we looked at was simply taking the money and giving it to a school committee, but the proposal as it laid out is that you'd have a committee of, of uh, three individuals, and, you know, my sense is, is, I don't know if I put in the, yeah, to benefit youth programs. So, you know, if the Lions Club wanted to still be involved and channel it through youth program, you know, that would be fine. We want to leave that open. It would also, you know, potentially fund a few non-school youth programs as well. And there'd be a committee the council would appoint uh, that, uh, you know, would actually give you up the money. But the, it's, it's, it's single sort. People would go in and just dump their stuff. Uh, we, Bob got a couple of, Bob Malley got a couple of different proposals. And, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to volunteer there and, and stink like beer and wine anymore. <laughs> uh, which, which is wonderful, one of those experiences at Cape Elizabeth. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately not everyone like the Lions Club, so uh, great people. So, and this gentleman okay, might want you. to say more. And the plan is to come back with more specifics in December, but because this affects a lot of groups, I wanted to get it out that with, with thinking about it and talking about it. Okay. Unlike Roosters, that we took six months and maybe they only voted one night, at least this thing, I, I don't, you know, I think it's, it is, uh, we need to at least give it a couple of meetings. So. Okay. Would you like to address the council? Yes. And we need your name and address, uh, please. Max Ray. Oh, Max Ray, REA, 50 Starboard Drive. And I'm a member of the Cape Lions, and uh, I just wanted to say that we really depend on that bottle shed every year. To, to raise money and this year especially where we lost the fun day family fun day so we didn't have any any sauce except the bottle shed really shaved, saved us on it and we always keep it clean and neat and we if we're called or somebody can't do it for the month and they call us we go right out and take care of it for them stay the whole month cold or hot or whatever it is so that's all i want to say just so you know that we appreciate having it just for my, as, a, as a loyal Rotarian, I'd like to say the Lions Club has really been great on this at bailing us out a couple of times when, when people have canceled last minute, as, as the gentleman has said. Uh, they have been great to work with, but you know, obviously they couldn't sustain it all 12 months. And uh, you know, I'm hoping that whoever the council appoints to this committee will recognize the Lions Club long-term traditional support of so many youth programs in Cape Elizabeth from uh, you know, obviously Lions Field being donated and uh, so many other things they've done. So we don't want to cut them out. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Yes. I mean, if the council in the coming year can accomplish something along these lines, it will be the best thing the council has done in a long time. <laughs> Speaking for the many parent volunteers who have sat in the bottle shed and you come out stinking of beer and wine and, for days. and, and you, you learn about who's had the big party the night before as well. Um, so, you know, you, <laughs> it'll be uh, nice to see some other way to raise money yeah, just to without that effort. Accept the manager's report. Okay. All right, I have a motion to accept the manager's report. 
which includes coming back here in December, by the way. Yeah. Council Walker. So moved. And, uh, and a second. A second. Mr. Sherman. And any more discussion? I'd like to add that I, I think it's a wonderful idea. I, certainly when I had swimmers in the Cape schools, I spent some time in the bottle shed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yep. so anyway, I, it seems like a really good solution to a, to a problem. So anyway, anyone else? All right, all those in favor? It's unanimous. And uh, just to, if I might, if any councilors have some idea and ideas for my draft of next month on a three-member committee of, you know, how you'd like that committee made up, feel free to let me know. And okay. It just might appear in the draft you suggested. And now, uh, last item is an opportunity for citizens to discuss anything that is not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone willing to, wishing to do that? Seeing no one, I will close that opportunity. And may I have a motion to adjourn? So Councilor Sherman. <laughs> and a second. Councilor Walsh. Yes. Yes. All those in favor? We are done. Good night. <laughs>